Between 1908 and 1924, nearly 20,000 Japanese, Okinawan, and Korean women arrived in Hawaii as picture brides, while thousands of others also migrated to the U.S. mainland. Now, photographs extended traditional matchmaking across oceans, but it reflects women's participation in 20th century immigrant communities. And in Hawaii, this concentrated immigration of young Japanese women and the subsequent growth of families changed the composition of sugar plantation communities from primarily single male laborers to a mix of families and laborers. I mean, immediately upon arrival in Hawaii, women contributed both paid and unpaid labor to their family and communities. And likewise, those women who arrived in the United States, their work and, and their work in their homes ensured the economic survival of their families and the development of a sustained family community in many Asian societies. Now, students, you are reading a very important chapter on Chinese prostitution and the importance of women and the roles that they played in maintaining labor forces for capitalist adventures as well as for community survival. Now, although Congress ruled at the turn of the 20th century that no Asian immigrant could become a naturalized citizen, the Supreme Court ruled that every person born in the U.S. is automatically a citizen, and it entitled, and it entitled citizens to leave and re-enter the country at will. So what's going to happen with the Chinese community to replenish the Chinatown populations is Chinese merchants brought in thousands of what are known as Chinese paper sons and paper wives. And these were fraudulent certificates that said that the Chinese or that the people were born in the United States. Immigration officials knew that most were fakes and they would question the applicants closely, but they had been thoroughly rehearsed and had, were prepared to accept the undocumented traffic. So again, students, please, you are reading an important chapter on Asian women, especially the experiences of Chinese prostitutes. Smuggling rings brought in an additional 17,000 across the Canadian and Mexican borders. And this smuggling experience continues to this day. It has just been part of the experience of the Asian uh, 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 since then. The U.S. government is going to strengthen its border control procedures, but to little avail. By the 1940s, over a fourth of the Chinese in the U.S. will have arrived, according to U.S. standards, illegally. Okay, this is simply because the United States never under, uh, offered a process by which to come in legally. So, it is not until the 1950s that they will obtain legal status under a federal amnesty program called the Chinese Confession Program, in which they admit, admitted their undocumented entry. CNN anchor Richard Louis reports on Paper Sons and Daughters a group of Chinese immigrants that brought fake papers and claimed to be the children of legal U.S. citizens in order to skirt the Chinese Exclusion Act. His report looks into studies that show one-third of today's current Chinese-American population are descendants, are descendants and actual paper sons or daughters today. Now, while he interviews this particular woman whose parents or grandparents, uh, grand, grandfather was a, a, a um, what was it, a, a paper son, uh, notice the quandary that she has with regards to uh, her, her status, because this is what happens in the United States, is that the nativist character, you develop the nativist character, it doesn't matter, once you're in the U.S., you then develop uh, the prejudice uh, against the immigrant. And in this particular case, you're going to see this Asian woman having qualms with regards to her grandfather. And my goodness, she's not even reflecting on the fact that the law, because of the way the law was and the racism, the racialization process, she can't understand how, again, the situation was. But let's go to the film clip and then maybe we can discuss it afterwards. Erica G. grew up like any other Los Angeles kid playing with Barbie and clutching on to Pooh Bear for dear life. But she was different. Her grandfather was not who he said he was. He'd come to the United States from China illegally as a paper son. 
paying about $1,800 to attach himself to another family. So I found out in high school, um, I was pretty surprised. And the legacy is that, you know, in some ways, our family came in illegally. And I was wondering, you know, are we going to get deported? Now 35 years old, Erica G. is with the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation, an organization that has researched paper sons. Who are these people? They don't have the same last name as us. You know, how could they be related to us? One scholar estimates 150,000 paper sons and daughters committed this crime to navigate around the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. We have to remember the times. It was during the Chinese Exclusion Act, and at that time, and still is to today, the only law uh, in the U.S. immigration history books that specifically uh, excluded a specific group of people, and those were Chinese laborers. 125 years ago this month, the Chinese Exclusion Act was approved by Congress. It stated that in the opinion of the government of the United States, the coming of Chinese laborers to this country endangers the good order of certain localities. The fear among the Californians and those especially in the Bay Area of all these Chinese wanting to take over their jobs. These are all people that were willing to work that helped to build the railroads and yet when the railroads were completed you know, all of a sudden there's this hysteria about the Chinese invading. For 61 years until 1943 it was illegal for Chinese who were not among the elite to enter the United States. David Leong was a paper son he was eight in 1940, the year he came through Angel Island Immigration Station, the main gateway for Chinese immigrants. While on the boat for 20 days, he memorized his coaching papers, grand cheat sheets that outlined who your fake parents and siblings were and who lived on certain blocks of your would-be family village in China. Young David had to convince his Angel Island interrogators he was the son of a Mr. Chan and not a Mr. Leong. So this is the interrogation room. This is where you walked in after three weeks. And, and what do you remember of this? I think it was me, interpreter, and uh, interrogator, and I think uh, two people in a panel. Leong passed the interrogation, and that's why today he was able to return with us to Angel Island Immigration Station. Today, there's only a rebuilt foundation of where the main administration building once stood. As we walked, Leong spoke about his acting ability as an eight-year-old and the life he escaped from in China. The Japanese was playing with shooting at us and missing us, but then the bullet was hitting the sand and the sand was rising, just like you've seen in the movies. Leong escaped a war as well as dirt floor living conditions to come to the United States. On Angel Island, he was alone with no family and recalls the fears he had. At night, I wouldn't go to the bathroom at all. There's people, I heard people have committed suicide in there because they couldn't get off the island. The fear Leong shares is what litters the walls of the Angel Island Barracks, poems of melancholy retrospectives of life in China, or simple hopes of freedom. Daniel Kwan is an architect specializing in museums and has been researching the history of Angel Island for 13 years. The uh, frustration that was felt by many of the detainees was uh, then uh, written on the walls as a, a statement, a, or sort of silent statement. And so for them, the feeling was this was a prison because they were just being held with a, against their will. And a lot, for a lot of people, this was, they'd heard about uh, the immigration process in China uh, but to actually have experienced it and, and lived in the wooden building, as they called it, uh, was something uh, uh, very different for them because they weren't used to being held against their will. Under reconstruction now, the barracks here at Angel Island Immigration Station held some 300 detainees at a time. The purpose was to keep them here from two weeks to two years as they were interrogated. They were trying to keep out illegal immigrants, potential paper sons, and potential paper daughters. Today, no one can enter inside the buildings of Immigration Station. The walls are falling, halls dangerous with holes in the floor, and the paint a mosaic of dilapidation. Still, many visitors come to the island to learn about their own past. Well, often we've, we've met people that um, come over here and they learn about their parents' past through research the National Archives or through meeting people that, are, that have worked with the Immigration Station. 
project uh, and didn't even know about it through their own family. And that is because many paper sons and daughters still feel embarrassment or even fear of being deported to this day. Which takes us back to Erica G. She was lucky enough to hear from her own grandfather who broke his silence and told her real family name was Chin. But some questions remain. Are you glad that your grandfather committed the crime? You know, in some ways, n no, because it was a crime. But at the same time, you know, I'm really fortunate that he did. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for the risks that he took in order to come over to the United States and to provide a better opportunity for his family. And when asked about immigrants trying to do what her grandfather did a century ago, she wavers. I, I don't know. I don't know if I feel comfortable saying, you know, it's okay for people to come in. So. It's perplexing for you, isn't it? Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese Americans face a similar dilemma. Researchers suggest that one in three Chinese Americans are survivors or descendants of the paper sun system. That's about one million people. And many only learn of their background as a loved one takes their paper secret to their grave, which was the case for Erica's cousins. Some of my cousins are a little confused because they, they don't read Chinese, and, but then they know our character, um, G, and then they're like, well, where is it on the tombstone? Erica still visits her grandfather's gravesite to pay her respects to a tombstone that has not one, but two names engraved. His paper's son name in English and his real name in Chinese. Richard Louis, CNN, Oakland, California. Well, one of the problems that you have with those who do assimilate is that they have identity problems later on simply because of their uh, unease with, regard, with regards to the community. And you have to understand that the United States created the situation in the first place of illegality. So here in the case you have Richard Louis, uh, who's an assimilated uh, a journalist, as well as Erica G who's an assimilated American. And they both have problems understanding uh, the Asian situation because they call them illegals. Uh, but there's nothing about Ill illegal about trying to get your families united. And though Erica G has problems with her identity in uh, uh, accepting her grandfather, uh, she did say that she was fortunate. But you see, fortunate just doesn't do it. Uh, Miss G, you are here. That's the key. You are here. Uh, so let's understand something about the Asian diaspora. Uh, 